so far we're getting ready to kick off here a little in just a moment or two uh, with dr mcnichol but our choreographer videographer has requested god bless pastor janet kimball smith god bless you uh that we fill in over here with dr mcnab yes he's all by himself over here and uh, i know he don't mind but it would be nice if we kind of filled in because when the camera is pointing down, it looks like nobody's in here. <laughs> so we can get some people maybe from the seventh row back to come and fill in over here. That would be awesome. You can not no no no. Don't leave this area. These two sections here is good. <laughs> I'm talking about and the, and the wings are are back there. If you can come and fill in in here, and I'm gonna ask these brethren that's coming in the door to also fill in over here. So if you wouldn't mind coming and filling in this area over here.
Yeah, these two sections here are the ones that are in the primary view of the camera. So if you're behind that uh, petition there or on the wing, if you can come and fill in this area here, let Dr. McMickle see your beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> And he saw Shadrach. Shadrach was doing like this. The king said, now, is he waving at me? Or just what is he doing? Shadrach said, no, I'm not waving at you. Oh, no. But I got a real reason to be waving my hand. He said, as long as I've been in this fire, and as hot as this fire is, it hasn't hurt my bones, and I just want to tell the Lord him because he ain't never left me alone. If you've been in a hot situation and you know God ain't never left you alone, would you act crazy for two seconds and praise him? Shack was in the furnace talking under his breath. King stuck his head in and he said, Good I afternoon. I, I said, Good afternoon. Uh, truly, we have been blessed by our facilitators thus far. Come on, let's put our hands together for our facilitators as we greet and welcome you to our first day of our Excel conference. Uh, 2023. Um, we thank God as today we are moving into our lecture series. Uh, we have one of God's uh, great voices uh, uh, for our time and in our season and um, in the person of Dr. Marvin McMickle, uh, who is the pastor emeritus of the Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he's done a great work uh, over many of the years, and um, I was fortunate enough to have him as one of my professors at Ashland Theological Seminary. Now, I don't know if it was good for him, but it was good for me. <laughs> Amen. And as Bishop Ross was asking, um, who uh, would we want to have for our uh, lecture series? He had heard Dr. McMickle uh, in Columbus during the simultaneous uh, simultaneous revival and wondered if we would be able to get him. And I said, well, let's try because he is still very much in demand even as he is retired. Um, but we, and so we thank God that when we called, uh, he said immediately, let me check my schedule and I'll get back with you. And he did it quickly. And I said, well, thank the Lord. I said, he is giving me some cool points with my bishop. Amen. And so we could read off a long list of his, his accolades and degrees. And, um, but one thing I will say, and that is, uh, Dr. Mimico, I think you, you brought, brought some of your books, right? Okay. Um, he has authored over 17 books, um, um, 17 books that he has available. Um, and there are many that uh, preachers and pastors, you will greatly benefit from. Uh, from the preaching style, preaching sort of like the source book that we all use for his cock and things of that nature. He has, God has given him wisdom to share these things and put, put them on uh, pen to paper. And so we are grateful to have such a wonderful, wonderful uh, pastor, preacher, friend, and uh, the former, former um, president of the Colgate Rochester Seminary. Amen. Uh, that's huge. That, that's huge. And so we want you to know who we actually have 
in our presence. You may hear about James Combs and others, but we will also be able to say we have heard from Dr. Marvin McMichael. And so today, let's put our hands together and receive our lecturer, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Marvin McMichael. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is the day the Lord has made, yes. and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to begin by thanking God for the privilege of just being alive one more day. And so he didn't have to do it. And uh, if it had been up to him and I was being judged on the merit of my life, he would not have done it. But as you said in your presentation this morning. Grace is greater than all our sins, and here we are by God's grace. So I'm thankful to him. I'm 74 years old, and um, I used to say, when folk would say, I have a reasonable portion of health and strength, I said, well, what does that mean? What is it? Now I know exactly what it means <laughs> to have a reasonable portion of health and strength. Every day I wake up, something else hurts. Uh, something else isn't working. Something else needs a little time to, you know, to get exercise. But I'm here, and I count that as a great, great mercy. I want to thank the bishop for inviting me. Thank you. He's been a friend of mine for 30 years. Uh, keeps bringing me down to Columbus for one thing or another. So I assumed when I was called, I was going to come to Columbus. I had no idea I was coming to St. Louis. But thank you for doing so. All the bishops, all the overseers, all of the clergy, Friends and former students, all of you, colleagues from Cleveland, what a joy uh, to be with you and to see all of you. Mercy is Cunningham. I was on my way to Cunningham's class, and I, he was teaching. I said, well, now I'm stuck. I got, I got two former students and two friends, so I'm with you today, but I'm going to Cunningham tomorrow. So uh, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not here, I'm not mad. Yeah. I, I got to go see my other son. So uh, we, we thank God. For that, I feel very much at home in uh, Kojic. Half my family is uh, Church of God in Christ. I don't know if any of you have ever known my uncle, uh, James Alford, Progressive Church of God in Christ, Maywood, Illinois, where he served for 44 years. And then his son, Donald Alford, took over the church. I'm not sure if Donald stayed with the, with the movement or went independent, but anyway, here's what used to happen. We would have family Thanksgiving dinners. Uh, we'd have Thanksgiving in Maywood. We'd have Christmas in Chicago because my mother and uh, another sister, and then Uncle James was the third of the siblings. So he would host us for Thanksgiving. We would host the family for Christmas in Chicago. Well, they would ask Uncle James to pray for the meal in Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for Christmas, Thanksgiving. But they would ask me to pray for the meal uh, for Christmas. But they weren't always sure if a Baptist prayer was going to get through. <laughs> they'd say, well, you know, we better, we better be sure that this food is duly consecrated. So I would pray my little Baptist prayer, and then they would, well, oh, you better come on now and finish this thing off. And then he would take off, and uh, he would add a finishing touch. So, uh, and you were talking about... Uh, folks who run around the church. So the first time my uncle asked me to preach at the Progressive Church of God in Christ, he said to me, and I should have gotten the cue from this, he said, I said, well, what time should I get there? He said, well, you should you get there when you get there, but we're going to put you up at around noon. <laughs> now, see, I didn't understand Kojic phrases. <laughs> you get there when you get there, but we're going to put you up at around noon. So it's around noon, and we're no, nowhere near getting up. So now it's around 1230. He said, well, I'm getting ready to put you up. And then 15 minutes after that, he said, okay, now you can go preach. Okay. But just when I'm getting ready to get up to preach, somebody gets hit by the Holy Ghost. And she just takes off running around the sanctuary. Well, you know, you can't run in Kojic without some accompaniment. 
you can't, you can't just run, you know. So, so the uh, Hammond organ gave us some running music. And then the saxophone had to come along and the drums came. And everybody, every other person must have had a tambourine. And so they were just tambourining and running and playing and I just carrying on. Seven times. I counted. Seven, it must be a holy thing. Seven times around the sanctuary. Then she had the nerve to sit down and say, now you can preach. Yeah, well, what's she going to do after somebody running around the church seven times? Uh, so I, you know, I forgot what I said, but I'll never forget her running seven times around the church. I finally got up at about one o'clock. So it was, uh, yeah, so I don't know what I did, but I got through it. Thank the Lord. Good to be here. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful for the privilege of being together. Whatever our denominational boundaries might be, there is no God but you. Your blood was sufficient on Calvary for the redemption of all of us. Baptists saved by the blood. Kojic saved by the blood. Full gospel saved by the blood. Methodists, Presbyterians, anybody who calls upon the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I'm glad for my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you glad for your salvation? Are you, are you glad the Lord did it for you? Picked you up, turned you around, put your feet on solid ground. Amen. Look out now, seven times. I'll keep count. Uh, I'd like to take a text from Psalm 51, but I'm going to read it initially in four different versions, all English. But I want you to listen as I do this to see if you can discern any recurring phrases, any recurring terms that, that the psalmist wants us to hear. I'm going to read it first in the New International Version, and then in the Message Version, and then in the Amplified Version and then in the, uh, in the NIV. Uh, so let's hear it first in the NIV. Psalm 51, beginning on verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Now listen to these actions. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. So I want you to hear these four terms first in the NIV. One, blot out my transgressions. Two, wash away all my iniquity. Three, cleanse me from my sin. And then jump down to verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. That's the NIV. Now let's try this in some other versions. I'm only going to read the first few verses, uh, but uh, looking for the same language. This is the Amplified Bible. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness and guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. And then in verse 7, purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. And then from the Common English Bible, have mercy on me, O God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin because I know my wrongdoings. And then in verse 7, purify me with hyssop 
and I will be clean. And then from the Message Bible. Generous in love, God give grace. Huge in mercy. Wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. And then in verse 7. Um, Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me. And I'll have a snow white life. There was uh, a motion picture that came out, oh, 25, 30 years ago that starred the action hero Arnold Schwarzenegger and the first African-American Miss America, Vanessa Williams. And the movie was called The Eraser. Vanessa Williams portrayed a person who worked for a federal government agency that oversaw the construction of highly uh, impactful weapons, rockets, missiles, that were meant only for use by the government and only under the circumstances of a declared war. These were not for the street use. But somebody wanted to use them for an ill purpose, and so they bribed the government in order to let them have these weapons, really to do great harm. Terrorists, drug traffickers, folks who wanted to overthrow legitimate governments. And, and they bribed this government agency so much that this person agreed to let these weapons go into the hands of those who were going to use them just to create havoc. Vanessa Williams found out about it, and she reported it to the federal government. They found out that she had done that and sent someone to kill her. But before they could get to her to kill her, the agency to whom she had reported this ill deed called another agency whose job it was to protect people who worked with them. Now, how do they provide that protection? They don't put you in a, you know, a house someplace. They don't, they don't, they don't put you uh, in a secret closet. They actually erase the fact that you ever existed. They, they erase your name. They erase your social security number. They erase your credit history. They erase your birth certificate. They issue you an entirely new identity so that you no longer, as the person you were, you no longer exist. You have been erased. And Schwarzenegger's job was to oversee the erasure from start to finish. Give me your credit cards. Give me your driver's license. Give me your birth certificate. Give me anything that anyone could use to track you. Give me that cell phone. They could follow those beeps. Give me everything that, that links you to who you were. And then he gave her new things and swore that it would be his job to protect her as she moved from the life that she had been to the life into which she was now going. Hence, he was called the eraser. I didn't come to do film criticism. I came to use that as a metaphor for you and me. The pathway to the presence of God requires an eraser. You don't, you don't, you don't just walk up on God. You're not, you're not, you're not, as you are, you're, you're not ready to be where God is. You, you need somebody to erase some things. And this, I, this, I think, brothers and sisters, is a missing component of contemporary church music 
and contemporary church preaching and contemporary church discussion. We talk about everything but sin. Of course the Lord deserves to be praised. Of course the Lord is worthy of our praise. Of course. I don't, I don't doubt that the Lord deserves to be praised. My question is, for what purpose does he deserve to be praised? Do, do, we, do we praise God because he is God? Yes. That's sort of what they would call in school the ontological argument. God is. Because I am, God is. Because God is, I am. God is worthy to be praised just because he's God. Woke me up this morning, started me on my way. A reasonable portion of health and strength. But God is not just the being, you know, God as being. God is also a doing. Count what God has done for you lately. And then translate what God has done for you lately into why you praise God. Really now, do you really praise God only because God is God? Or do you praise God because of what God has done, is doing, and what you firmly believe God will continue to do in your life? God is worthy of praise, not just because of his identity, but because of his activity. The Lord has done great things for me, whereof I am glad. You, you, you gotta work, you've got to work into your theology and work into your music and work into your preaching the fact that God has, has blessed us anyhow. Look beyond my faults saw my needs. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Wonderful, marvelous, matchless grace. Grace that exceeds my guilt and my stain. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured there was the blood of the lamb was shamed for me. So we, we, we have to find a way to work back into our preaching back into our singing. You don't, you, don't, you don't need a redeemer if you don't need to be redeemed. <laughs> you don't need a savior if you don't need to be saved. You don't need someone to come and seek out the lost if you're not lost. But if you are lost and you need to be saved and you need to be redeemed, and then God makes available someone who can save and redeem and find you and lift you. Now that is worthy of praise. We ought to stop right now and just praise the Lord because he sought us out and, and redeemed us. But now how does God do it? How, how, how does God work on us so that this happens? That's what Psalm 51 is about. This is... So, in order to appreciate Psalm 51, you have to understand Psalm 51 as David's confession after Bathsheba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to get Psalm 51 if you don't get 1 Samuel 17. <laughs> so, the king is out on his porch. Walking along the balcony, you know, to catch the evening breeze. And uh, he turns the corner, surveying <laughs> his domain. And you know, these ancient kings thought, whatever my eyes see is mine. And his eyes saw something. They saw a beautiful young woman bathing. She was behind the curtain, but he was up so high, he could kind of look down over that. Now, David had some options. He could have 
turned around. He could have. He could have kept on walking. Couldn't he? He could have just kept walking. He, he, he could have said, oh, she's pretty, and just gone on about his business. But he didn't. He sent for a servant. And, and he asked the servant, who is that? And the servant's answer was, that is Bathsheba, the wife of your servant, Uriah. Now, so, so you, we now know the relationship. You now know that that is Bathsheba. You know that she is married, and you know she is married to somebody in the army who is serving you on the battlefield right now. He knew all of that before he said, bring her here. Ah, okay, maybe, maybe you could say he wanted to ask her, had she heard from Uriah? Maybe you could say he wanted to pray with her about the well-being of Uriah. You maybe? Who knows what the options were? He, the king had a lot of options, but we found out what he wanted. Bring her here, and then you leave, and I will have the kingly option of a one-night stand. And in ancient Israel, women could not say no to the king. There are kings today. People of great power who specialize in one night stands. No names mentioned. They pay for those one night stands. Just like David did. Because nine or a few months later, you see, Bathsheba sends a note to David that said, I've missed my period. And Uriah is still on the battlefield. And the only person by whom and through whom I can account for this is you. Just so you know, get ready to be a daddy. So the first sin, the first sin for uh, David is lust. The second sin for David is adultery. He married, she married. Now come some more sins. Okay, says David. He sends word to send Uriah back from the battlefield. And says, let, let me just tell me how the battle is going. And then once I get debriefed, then I'm going to send you home. And you can spend some time with Bathsheba. And I'll send some food. And y'all can have a wonderful evening together. And then tomorrow morning, when that's all over, you can go back to the battlefield. He thought that that would then account for how she was pregnant. As if folks can't count months. Okay, but never mind that. He forgot that in Israel, the law was that as long as your regiment was on the battlefield, you would not go in to be with your wife because the other folks in your regiment can't do that. So you suffer with them, even if you are not with them. So he slept outside of his front door so all the world could see he did not go in. So now that didn't work. So the third sin was trying to, you know, cover up what he had done. But it got worse. Okay, if I can't get you to go in, let me try something even more sinister. He sends a note to the general. And the note says, push Uriah to the front of the battle line. Pull all the other soldiers back. So the arrows from the opposing army can focus their attention only on him and make sure he's dead. Who is this? This is Uriah, your servant. Make sure he's dead. And then once we confirm that he is dead, then I can act as if I am being compassionate by bringing Bathsheba into my house and I will take care of her as a grieving widow and a compassionate king and folk will say, what a wonderful king we have. 
And it would have worked if there hadn't been a prophet. Boy, those prophets pop up at the worst possible time. Just when you thought you were about to get over, here comes the prophet. And Nathan, you know, now prophets, have to, they still have to take care of their neck because kings are unpredictable. So, so Nathan didn't confront him. He appealed to his heart. He said, I want to tell you an old story. I need your advice on something. So I, I heard about a man who had uh, some visitors one night. And they wanted, you know, to spend the night. And he didn't have a meal prepared, so he wanted to fix them a nice dinner. And the man had a hundred sheep. He could have taken any one of those hundred sheep. But instead of taking one of his one hundred sheep, he chose to go across the way to take the one baby lamb that belonged to his neighbor, kill it, and serve it to his friends. And Nathan said to David, what, what do you think should be done to such a man? And David said, such a man who did a thing like that ought to be killed. Such a man who did a thing like that ought to be killed. Now, says Nathan, you are that man. And all that David could say in response is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. For my transgressions are always before me. But in order to get out what's wrong with me, and in order to get out what's wrong with us, there are layers of cleansing that must be done. One size does not fit all. Some folk need a little more work than others. So did you catch those layers that no matter which version of Psalm 51 you read, you kept running into these phrases. Wash me, cleanse me, blot out, purify me, take me to the laundry, you know, get everything that's in me out of me. So David gives God options. First, he says, Lord, blot out my transgressions. There's a little water there. I'm going to just blot it out. I got some soup on my tie. Blot it out. Sometimes it's just surface sin. You didn't do too much. You didn't, you know, you, you, you didn't kill anybody. Just a, just, you know, just a little thing. But it's ungodly. But God can fix it. You're not past redemption. Just blot it out. No, I said the Lord, no, no, blot me, won't do this. All right, then, wash me. That's, that's, more, that's more than blotting. That's, you know, that's the scrub board. That's the washing machine. That's labor intensive. You know, Dick Gregory, the comedian Dick Gregory, uh, once posed this question. He says, if you've got a load of dirty clothes and you put it in a washing machine, but you take out the agitator and you run the cycle without the agitator, what do you end up with? You end up with a washing machine full of wet, dirty close because you didn't really wash them. You just let them sit there for a while. Sometimes soaking will do it, but sometimes you've got to agitate. You've got to work. You've got to do something that gets the sin out of you. So blot it out, wash it out, soak it out, cleanse it out. But sometimes it's too deep. <clears throat> this is an indelicate illustration, but I must make it. Hyssop was a purgative designed to get out of you 
what was troubling on the inside of me. The whole point of hyssop was to make you throw up. You can't get it out by yourself. Have you, ever, have you ever had that moment when there was something in you and you kept coughing, <laughs> trying to, you drank water to try to calm it down, no, nothing. And then, and then suddenly, whatever was in you, I told you this was indelicate, whatever was in you, you finally found a way to the bathroom to get it out of you. Now, did you feel better before or after you got purged? What God is saying about sin is you will feel better after you get it out of you, but sometimes it takes some purging, like you purge your closet. When you purge your closet, you don't just set things aside in a different room. If you're going to purge, you're going to get it out of the closet, out of your house, out of your mind, out of your budget, out of your life. Purge me. Who needs a little purging today? Who, who needs for God to do something in you that you cannot do by yourself? Purge me. David was the king. But he realized the depth of his sin. I wish more of us would enter into that transaction. Sometimes the higher up we go, the less likely we are to consider that we are even available for sin. Or as Nixon said, if the president does it, it's not illegal. I think there are some folk in Washington who think that if they do it, it's not illegal. I can lie. It's all right. I can rape. It's all right. I can steal. It's all right. I can defy a subpoena. It's all right. I can defame someone's character. It's all right. If I do it, it's all right. Don't you do it. But if I do it, well, it's all right. And, and we have to figure out the way by which we ask God to deal with us. Blot it out. Wash it out. Clean it out. Purge it out. And what God does is that God will do exactly what we ask God to do. He will get it out of us. But once he does, you see, once God gets out of us what should not be in us, then what God expects is that we'll fill the empty space with that which should be there. It's not just a matter of moving some things out. It's also a matter of moving some other things in so that the person that we were is no longer the person that we are. The man I used to be, I am not anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go anymore. I'm from Chicago. I listened to you very carefully this morning. You got some Rodney stories. I got some Marvin stories. I wasn't always up here doing this. I'm from the south side. And I did whatever folk on the south side were doing. Now, some folk will lie and say that they didn't enjoy it. Oh, I was out there, but I didn't have a good time. No, no. <laughs> I was out there, and I enjoyed every minute, every minute of it. What they did, I did. What they smoked, I smoked. What they drank, I drank. Where they went, I went. My four best friends had names that all started with J, and not one was Jesus. <laughs> Jack, Daniel, Jim, Bean, Johnny Walker, Black, and Red. There was no blue in those days, or no black, but, I, but I've, I've caught up since then. Yeah, okay, okay, well, never mind, never mind. And, and I had companionship. I better stop right there. I had companionship. <laughs> and uh, it was the Chicago. And it was the South Side. And it was the 60s. And I had companionship. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to be all of this. But then, at one point, our paths crossed. 
and she went off in one direction. I moved and went off to college, and I never really came back to Chicago too much after that, except that when my father died, of course. Now, my parents had divorced when I was 10 years old, so you know, my father was never really a part of my life, but he's my father, so I came back this week. Much to my surprise, this person came to my father's funeral. She had never even met my father because he was out of my life when I was 10 years old. That was eight years before I even met her. But she, she came to my father's funeral. And then she came to me. And I said, oh, how, how thoughtful of you to come to my father's funeral. See, I didn't, I didn't come to see your father. I did, I, I'm not here to pay respects. I heard that I might corner you here. And I've heard that you call yourself a preacher. And I just, I just had to come to ask you a question. I want to know how you got from where we were to where you say you are. Because I know you. Now you see, this is the dilemma for all saved people. At some point, all saved folks have people who knew them before they were saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with other spirits, but it might not have been the Holy Spirit. And they will tell you, well, I, we used to do this together, we used to do that together, so what? forth and so on. What? I knew you. Yeah. How did you get from where we were, fact, yeah. to where you say you are, hypothesis? Because I know you. Yeah. 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 Now, the only thing that I could do with that, Bishop Ross, was to correct the tense. All I could say was, no, you don't know me. You knew me. You knew who I was. You, you knew how I lived. You knew what I did. You knew me. What you, what you have not caught up with is that you don't know me. You don't know how he picked me up. You don't know how he turned me around. You don't know how he put my feet on solid ground. You don't, you don't know how the conjunction word but factors into my salvation. But, 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 but. I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking, sinking. If the Lord had let me stay on the path where I was, I would have been sinking either in the county jail or the graveyard, sinking deep in sin. And then the conjunction kicks in. But. Anybody here been saved on a conjunction? But. I was going in one direction, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, lifted me, now safe am I. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I want, now I, I once was Absolutely, positively, unequivocally lost. But now am found. Was blind. But now I see. Saved on the conjunction. But saved from something to something. You see, you're not saved. You're, you don't really appreciate your salvation until God has replanted you somewhere else 
to a life that is in contrast to the life that you were living. So we now come to this fascinating story that uh, Jesus tells about a man who had been forgiven much. He talks about a man who owed somebody, you know, 20,000 talents of silver. Gosh, that's the equivalent of a million dollars today. You, you, were, you owe somebody a million dollars. And the man just says, forget it. Wipe the slate clean. Go about your business. You could, you could not in 10 lifetimes pay me this back. Just go. Thank you. You're leaving debtor's prison. You run across somebody who owes you $25. You've been forgiven a million. You are owed $25. And you tell them, if you don't pay me what you owe me, all $25 of it, I'm going to throw you into prison. And the word gets back to the original person who had forgiven a million and said, you mean to tell me I can forgive you of much and you cannot forgive them of little? Our deal is off. Go, go to hell. Go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You go right into jail and stay there till you pay back a million dollars. What God wants to see us do is go from the sins of our past to the grace of our future, that we, we can become like Christ, that we can reflect Christ. In the act of grace and mercy and kindness and forgiven. As a sign of what God has done for us. Somebody in your class was sitting over there. I think it was the young man in the shirt right there. And you were asking, why, why should we do things for Christ? And his answer was, because of what Christ has first done for us. You mean to tell me that if the Lord can lay his life down. If the Lord can allow himself to be nailed to a cross. If the Lord can endure a crown of thorns. If the Lord can hang beneath the baking Mediterranean sun hour after hour. He who was sinless suffering for those of us who are sinful. If he can do that for us, you mean we cannot do something for somebody else? And part of the sin nature of us is that we do not reflect in our relationship with others the grace that God has reflected in his relationship to us. There are some things that we should erase. Who offended you five years ago and you're still mad? Who, who did something you did not like and you're still angry? Suppose God treated us like we treat other folk and God holds on to grudges and God does not let go and God says, you know, when you were a teenager, you did this and that and now you're 74 and I'm still mad. No, God said, I will take your sin and I will cast it into a sea of forgetfulness so it will not rise to haunt you in this life or in the judgment. It will be as far as the east is from the west. I am living beneath an umbrella of God's grace. And every now and then, all I have to do is invite somebody under my umbrella to receive the grace that God has given to me. Erase. God erases things from our lives. God invites us to erase things from the lives of others that may have hurt us. Now, let me pause and, and, and offer a contemporary observation. There are some things I do not want to be erased. I don't want to have the erasure of black culture. See, these people who want to limit what books can be read, what history can be taught, 
what stories can be told. What songs can be sung. I don't want to have, I don't want to have all of me culturally or historically erased. I like Mozart, but not more than Mahalia Jackson. I'm giving my age away. I don't have any contemporary names to offer. I'll let you all fill in the blanks. I, I like uh, cauliflower, but not more than collard greens. I like Rice Krispies, but not more than grits. I don't want you to erase me. I want you to remember what you did. I'm reading a book now, I recommend it to all of you, called The Rediscovery of America. It is by a Native American historian at Yale University who begins with the observation that Columbus did not discover America because it was never lost. He accidentally found what is now the Dominican Republic. He never even got here. Why are we celebrating Columbus Day in St. Louis when he never even got to Missouri? And when he got where he was going, because of the diseases that Europeans brought with them, half the population died from infectious diseases, and the rest were killed off in the, in the, in the process of forced labor. Well, you can't tell that story. You can't talk about the Native Americans who used to live on this land. I come from Cuyahoga County in Ohio and Chicago in Illinois, and neither one of those are Anglo-Saxon words. They are landmark terms reminding us of who was here until greed decided to move them out. And right now, in the Middle East, the same thing is playing out. Now, there are, there are, no, there are no clean hands. There's sin on both sides. On the one side, you take the Palestinians who've been living on that land for 2,000 years. And because the Jewish people need a homeland after the Holocaust, you move all the Palestinians out in order to move the Jewish community in, I understand the Holocaust. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic. But then you ask yourself, what are you going to do with the folk you moved out? Erase them? As if they never existed? And tell them, well, no, God meant for us to have this land and not you. So then they get mad and they attack you on last Saturday in the most brutal of ways, and then you get mad and you bomb them in the most brutal of ways because both sides want the same thing. Remember the 1970s TV show, All in the Family? Archie Bunker, Edith Bunker, Michael and Gloria. Don't let somebody sit in Archie's chair. You can't sit in my chair. You can sit over here, you can sit over there, but you cannot sit in my, that is my chair. Who gets to sit in the chair is really the question. Who belongs? Who has a place? Who has worth? Who has value? Who can sit in the chair? White folks say only we can sit in the chair. Men say only we can sit in the chair. America says only we can sit in the chair. Palestinians say only we can sit in the chair. Jews say only we can sit in the chair. Here's the deal. God made all the chairs for all the people and God has enough for all of us if we learn how to share what God has given to all of us. But our sin is while God has given us enough we tend to hoard for ourselves the best part and leave all the rest for somebody else. 
Block it out. Block, block me out. Wash me out. Cleanse me out. So I want to give you this closing illustration. I told you already that I was not a good boy. Even in school, I was not a good boy. And so after class in Chicago, the teacher would keep me back for an assignment. My assignment was to take some water and wash off the chalkboard. For those of you who remember chalkboard and, and long white sticks of chalk. But you know, you, you, could, you could erase it and you could wash it, but you could still see some residue on there. Okay, so you, that, it, it's been washed, but not completely gone. Then take the erasers, Bishop, down to the basement. And there was a room down in the basement that had an updraft. And you could bang these erasers together. And the updraft would take the residue from the eraser up into the atmosphere and carry it away so they would never come back to haunt that blackboard again because it had been banged together, thoroughly blotted, thoroughly washed, thoroughly cleansed, thoroughly purged. All the dust was gone. I discovered later in life that exercise in the blackboard was my life. That what God has done for me is to wash away cleanse away, wipe away all of my sins, all of my transgressions, and then on Calvary, what God did was bang together the erasers of my life so that all of my sins were shaken free, taken up, carried away, and I no longer have to bury them or carry them or worry about them. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And here I am all of these years later still thanking God, not for the goodness of me, but for the grace of God, still saying to God, thank you, because when I was lost, you found me. Thank you, because when I was crazy, you sustained me. Thank you, when I was selfish, you provided for me. Thank you, when I was blind, you helped me to see. Thank you, thank you, thank you for grace that is sufficient for all of mine. And all of that starts with my confession of sin. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If that is not a God who is worthy of praise, I don't know one who is.